So I farm so hard, the employees wanna find me And then wanna hire me What's 100k to a guy like me? Could you please remind me? Farm so hard, this ain't easy Working late nights, you best believe me My grades can only go ace Never wanna see another B unless I'm Jay-Z What's good, fam? It's your host, Jim Pruitt, a.k.a. Farm Z and the ED, and I bring you another episode of the Farm So Hard podcast. You know we do important work here, and we're always focused on giving you guys the latest and the most updated information when it comes to ED, all pharmacy, hospital pharmacy, and just pharmacy in general. So we have a special episode, and, and usually I say that, and it's cool because it's a cool it's a cool clinical topic or something like that. We're going to change gears today. We're going to talk about something a little different and today we're going to be discussing DEI, transparency, and advocacy in pharmacy organizations. And I think a lot of us know where this is stemming from, but I won't ruin it, it for you. We want to dive into this because, again, DEI has been something that's been talked about and a lot has been promised and a lot has been talked about over the last few years. But we've had some people that's been actually in the background making sure so many things are working. And we want to hear from the frontline people. Uh, we want to hear from people who's been discussing and impacted by what DEI actually means. I've been fortunate to be part of some of these programs, but again, I've had some people that's doing a little bit more work than me. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest for today. Kevin, we're going to start with you. Give us a quick background on yourself. Hey, uh, Jimmy, thanks for having me. My name is Kevin Astle. I'm an assistant professor with the University of South Florida, um, practicing ambulatory care and um, you know, passionate about um, DEI in all forms. And um, really, um, you know, in my kind of personal time, I had spent work a lot with the Farm Grad Wishlist team as one of the um, leadership team members and uh, one of the founding members of RX Share um, for Sexual and Gender Minority Health. Sarah. Thanks for having me, Jimmy. My name is Sarah Cummins. I'm an opioid stewardship pharmacist and a pretty outspoken proponent of equity and transparency and ethics in healthcare, particularly our pharmacy profession. I have done a lot of work on DEI and pharmacy recruitment in, in my own institution and throughout some state organizations as well. So I'm really excited to be here today to talk about it further. Absolutely. Thank you both for coming on. I will be remiss if we, we, we don't mention that jam again. We would love for her, her, her to be here uh, again if she has some stuff going on. Uh, but we, we, this is the an initial thought getting her on for a, a three person interview. But let's go ahead and just transition and talk about the email. That's what everything kind of led out to. And the spark of all of this was really that. Uh, but let's kind of transition to that because then that was really what led us to this entire episode. But again, this is something that's been stewing behind in the background that we really need to talk about. All right. So let's go ahead and discuss the email that was sent from the ACCP president that sparked significant conversations. Kevin, can you give us your initial reaction to that email and really dive into, again, what that email, what, what points it really hit for you? Because again, a lot of this has been stuff that's been going on in the background for a while. Yeah. When seeing the email, my first reaction was a gut punch. Um, you know, it was really hard to read something calling um, indirectly myself and other friends and colleagues that I hold in high esteem, uh, unprofessional and lacking integrity and um, just really processing what those words meant. Um, as pharmacists, you know, day one in pharmacy school, we're taught the oath of a pharmacist, the, um, you know, pledge of professionalism. And, you know, that's something that we hold really near and dear to our hearts. And, um, to have that questioned over, you know, asking an organization to be accountable for um, some of their commitments really hurt. Um, it was difficult. And, you know, after having some background conversations with leadership from ACCP, it really felt like a blind side um, and felt like there was a lot of miscommunication that was happening uh, from the, on the organization side. Absolutely. Sarah, what, what's your thoughts on all of this? To me, it read like everyone being involved in or participating on sharing in social media was being scolded. To me, that is unprofessional. I think the part that really bothered me the most is the line that says, we must work within the system to improve conditions we find unsatisfactory and need of attention. We should strive to offer positive suggestions for improvement and be willing to participate in efforts to accomplish change. To me, it reads like that wasn't already done. 
like that wasn't already attempted when in fact it has been attempted and has been done in the background for years and years. And a lot of the people participating in that work have been incredibly patient, have been persistent and have gone through the system that is mentioned in this letter. And yet the result is still the same. The outcomes are not changed. Nothing is different. And so the way that we have sort of attacked this now is to be more transparent and open with these discussions because working within the system didn't work. And for that to be the suggestion, it almost feels like silencing, like we are are being squelched and in our outspokenness, in our words, and our opinions about the organizations that are supposed to represent us as professionals. Yeah, I, I definitely hear you with that. Kevin, anything to, to, to bounce off of from that? Yeah, I think, it, you know, just like that, getting called to the principal's office and, um, you know, social media is the way that we communicate nowadays. It's a way that we share ideas and collaborate, communicate, um, and really, you know, when even the social media utilization started in this situation, it was really just, Hey, I'm seeing this. Are y'all seeing this? Like, you know, we've been seeing this for years now, you know, what's going on here. And really, you know, it was really just trying to spark a conversation. It wasn't even so much as attacking the organization or any individuals in the organization. It was really, this is an issue we see all across pharmacy uh, organizations. When is change going to happen? Because we've been calling for it for years and it's still the same thing. Absolutely. And I want to make sure I caveat this by saying that, again, not everyone is okay with those conversations. And I've seen some people have some smart comments to say back to you just by the questioning of that before the the email kind of came out. And I I think it takes a lot of of bravery to be able to ask these questions. And it almost feels to me like if you are of a certain demographic or if you if you're perceived to be something, you should be quiet. You shouldn't say anything in, in this space or or. You know, I'm. I don't think that we have enough qualified people to 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 look at for some of these awards or some of these committees or some of these leadership positions. It, it really seems that it takes a lot to even say something about it because when you do, this happens. This is the, the same thing that, that that happens quite quite a bit, and that's why for me, I prefer again having platforms like I've, I've built over this period of time, so we can have an avenue to be able to talk about some of these things because again, it, it seems like. In certain certain organizations, and just this is not just an ACCP thing. So let's go ahead and put that out there as well. This is a, something that's happening across medicine. This is something that happens all all, all across multiple institutions. So we don't, we don't want to single out someone and say, "Hey, this has happened." But it's something that we're seeing, and it's it's something that came up, and a lot of discussion was was being built. And that's how I took it initially when you, when, you, when I saw your tweet, when I saw everyone else kind of responding. It was like a, more of a dialogue that was being built that for. As 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 an entrepreneur and as someone who owns a business, that's feedback for you right there that can be utilized and it's it's free. Uh, yeah, most people have to pay for that type of feedback and and it's free for a lot of people out there. So I I was intrigued by the language in the, of the, of the email. Um, I think it was in, what was even more intriguing was the deletion of it, like from the social media platform as well, because it was like, oh, this is what we have out. It's like, okay, don't look at that. So it really. It was intriguing to me. Sarah, you, you, any comments before we move forward to talk about social media a little bit more? I think you're exactly right. In some of the backlash that we, Kevin and I, experienced um, on Twitter after speaking out against this. And I just want to clarify real quickly that that excuse saying that we don't have enough qualified candidates, that's objectively false. And if what you're finding is that you're, you don't have enough candidates of a diverse racial or ethnic socioeconomic group, then your processes need fixed. What you're really doing when you say something like that is that our methods still give those of the cis heteronormative majority an advantage because of the the dogma and the systems that we've had in place for years and years. Our profession is so much more progressive than it was 50 years ago. And if you're still using the same types of people and the same types of processes, it's time to fix that. And I can name plenty of people who probably qualify for those awards that are diverse. And the fact that you try to say that there's just not enough is is false. 
you need to look harder. You need to change your recruitment strategies. You need to try to find people that can provide nominations for the awards that you're trying to give to people. Stop being so passive about these awards. Find the people that deserve them. It's not as hard as everybody makes it out to be. And it's baffling to me that we're still having these same conversations year after year. It's definitely something that's, that's intriguing because I, I see it now because when I form a lot of a lot of the systems that I do, like for example, my, my conference, I I meet my group, I say, we're going to find somebody from pediatric, we're going to find somebody from the community, we're going to find somebody from academic, and then we're going to find, make sure we have enough women, we're going to make sure we have an, enough of everyone so that, again, when I'm, again, the things that I make, I say it's for us and by us. So I want that to look like who we, tr we, tr we truly are. And I realize there's a system that you can say from the from the top down and say, hey, this is what we're going to do. We need to find people that, that fit this, this mold. And I, I haven't had as, as hard of a, a challenge. Again, my demographic and, and the people that I'm looking for is a smaller group of people, usually emergency medicine based. But I, I think that when you when the, when leadership says, this is what we're going to do and everyone needs to get on board with this and this is how we're going to look at things, it makes it so much easier because we can say, OK, let's make sure we have all everyone represented. It. And there's just it's tons of people. There's tons of people that are qualified. Uh, but again, I, I think there are some challenges and I think the issue is sometimes you're in that bubble still. You're in that bubble. Everyone who you know who's looking looking in the same place that you've been looking at for a period of time and maybe, again, getting some different people uh, in the, in that that space can help you find those people uh, more, more easily. But I want to transition a little bit into, again, social media as a platform of advocacy. So let's go ahead and transition to that. All right. So, so moving on to the, this space, and I can I can see there's a ton of different things, and social media is going to be huge when it comes to advocacy, and it's changed over the years. Like over the last three to five years, we've seen a drastic change in how pharmacy, how medicine uh, views social media. And Sarah, I know you've been quite active on Twitter. Uh, it's something that was really my, my claim to fame. And, and how effective do you think social media is for raising these type of concerns in all types of in conversations to be had. I think social media is an excellent place to raise concerns, especially with respect to our governing bodies and professional organizations organizations. In fact, I know it's an effective place to raise, raise concerns because of what has transpired here with ACCP. They clearly saw our tweets, they clearly saw our messaging and they responded how they saw fit. While that response wasn't exactly what we were hoping for, it does prove that this message is being received. And overall, I feel like there's a danger in silencing your constituents or discouraging them from speaking out on social media or Twitter specifically. Silence in general is how oppression and violence and injustice is perpetuated throughout systems and time. And this is one of the reasons I feel so strongly about speaking out against injustices in our profession overall, because so many members of our community feel silence. Like I can feel that in my replies. I can feel that in my direct messages. There's a lot of people who respond and say, I wish that I could say the things that you're saying, or I wish I could support this, but I'm scared. I'm scared to speak out. I'm scared of repercussions. And to me, that should not be the type of environment that our, our profession is fostering. You can label this route of communication as unprofessional as much as you want, but it produces results. It promotes transparencies about issues that really direct directly affect us as pharmacists. Absolutely. Kevin, what do you got to say about that? This is, that was phenomenal. Yeah, I think, you know, kind of echoing everything Sarah said, you know, we always love the old adage that pharmacy is a small world and Twitter has made that small world even smaller. You know, it puts all of us right in the same room together and we're all able to have conversations um, and we're able to, you know, discuss ideas that wouldn't otherwise happen. You know, I'm not going to start an email thread with people across the country that I don't even know to have a conversation like this. Um, and Twitter, social media in general, gives us that platform to say, hey, what do y'all like? Do you all agree with this? Do you, do you see what's going on? You know, let's discuss this and make that conversation happen in real time, um, you know, with real opinions. And, you know, it, the danger comes with any kind of, uh, electronic communication, whether that's text message, social media, whatnot, where you know, things can get misinterpreted, the emotions and tone get lost. But I think at the end of the day, you know, as organizations, you know, we 
you should want to be accountable. You should want your members to speak out. Uh, when I've met with ACCP, I told them, you know, the reason why I am passionate about this, why I am vocal about it is because I care about the organization. I care about the mission. Um, and I do believe, you know, when, I, when they have made initiatives for DEI, that I think they are one of the ones that are more aggressive at it in general and have, you know, truly made more efforts to advancing DEI. But when there are laps, that's when we need to say, hey, you know, this is a gap right here. We need to address this. Um, what's happening is not cutting it. Absolutely. And I think when we think about this in an organization standpoint, it seems to be a little bit more backlash. But every other system and every other process that we're part of, think about like our MUEs. We literally create a system, see how it is, and then we evaluate utility of these programs and settings that we put up. And if there's something that is off, we make adjustments to it. And it seemed that we're all human. And I think that part of it com comes with that. And I, when there's discussion, I think people with authority sometimes feel like you're, you're questioning more than what it what really is. And I can, I can understand that to a degree. But one of the things that we haven't really mentioned yet is how social media has was completely the reason why certain things in the past have happened with, with certain members that was completely inappropriate. And the only way that anything actually any action ha happened was due to the a level and the severity of the advocacy when it came to someone being so inappropriate and having evidence that was out there that no one could deny it uh i think that was something that was was huge because when it came up i think everyone knew of this person everyone knew of the accolades and things of that nature and to be frank i don't really think things would have changed if it wasn't as vocal and as open um, I would open my Twitter. I'm like, whoa, my eyes are just like wide open when it came to that that scenario a couple of years back. And um, not to discredit the the academic work that happened, but it was from, it was from professional things that were, were occurring that people want to be quiet about. And then the, the, some brave people really stepped up and, and made some things happen. So I don't know if you guys want to comment any on that, but I, when, every time I think about advocating on, on social media, that's the one example. I was like, well, it this wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for social media. Yeah, I think if that were left up to an email inbox, it very easily would have gotten either ignored or gotten, you know, generic response of, oh, we'll look into it. You know, we'll see how things are, you know, very easily brushed over and would have been made a non-issue. Um, you know, I think knowing how the organization leadership likes to function is kind of in that, um, you know, need to know basis. And if something's not pretty and doesn't make us look good, then let's not, you know, highlighted it. Nobody wants to highlight that, but that's the reality of the situation. You know, is we have to look at our faults and look at, you know, mistakes and find ways to rectify it. So, yeah, I think with the, without social media, that would have been so easily swept under the rug, and it probably has for many years. Yeah. Are there any comments on that? Absolutely. Um, I will, without revealing too much about the identities of anybody involved with this, uh, this was a man who was preying on. Uh, those in a position inferior to his own professionally in a sexual nature that is completely inappropriate. And I can tell you as a woman and as someone who's been through the system, he's definitely not the only one. And I, I did notice that there was some discourse here about if this would have been presented to ACCP, if this would have been presented, they probably would have swept it under the rug. Well, that is exactly what happened. There was email communication about it and nothing changed even at this person's initial institution it was reported through hr it was reported by students and his victims and they did not fire him they gave him letters of reference to find a new job at a new institution where he went on to perpetuate the same type of sexual violence against his learners and those that he worked with so you can't tell me that working through the system is the way to go like that was such a slap in the face to everybody who was involved in that situation and everybody who spoke out against it the women in particular that's something that is always i think one of the biggest fears of speaking out against this particular type of oppression and violence is that you're not going to be believed that you're going to cause more trouble for yourself and that this person is going to just continue in perpetuity of all of the the things that they are doing that's inappropriate or wrong and there's going to be nothing that comes of it it was only when 
screenshots were posted, identities were revealed, people had to speak up and name themselves and the abuser that change happened. And it never should have taken that. It never should have taken that. And we could have saved so many women from this type of violence had it just been taken seriously the first time. Yeah, I, I completely hear you in that because it, I, I just think about all these things and realize that without social media, certain movements in today's world just don't get taken off. That's one that's one that's extreme, of course. But as we look through certain aspects, we realize that's kind of the power of all of this. It's, that's, that's kind of the power when it comes to free speech and being able for everyone to be fort facing and see all these things, because without social media and the ability to advocate as, as a group and as and even as individuals, certain things won't won't happen, unfortunately. And again, you, you look at institutions and you look at when they're thinking from the top down, the CEOs, the people who are in, in, in leadership, you don't want your organization to look a certain way. You don't want to be attached to certain things. You don't necessarily always want to act quickly. Uh, but this scenario, again, made people have to move. So um, I just, again, all those that was involved in that particular movement, it, it really just shows the power of it. And that's why, personally, I think that, again, can there, can there can there be things said in a particular way? Yeah, but when the truth is put out there, we have to assess that feedback and respond accordingly. Um, so that's 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 the last I would say when it comes to advocacy on, on social media. It's something that has changed rapidly. It will continue to change. It will be a, a everlasting uh, part of our future when it comes to not just pharmacy but just all uh, healthcare in general. So. That's, that's the last I have to say about that. And we, we can move forward unless you guys have any, anything else to add. All right, so let's move on to this next section for with DEI committees and, and transparency. Uh, this has been something that, again, is due to my demographics I've been uh, thrusted into and feel like I've had to really kind of put some out there. And really for me, I've tried to focus on providing a platform for more, more, more people instead of focusing solely on me, but giving a platform and doing different things. Uh, DEI, I, I say it, is is displayed and, and captured in many ways. Uh, and it comes from many people. I, I think the Foreign Grant Wish List really highlights this and the work that Sarah's been doing, uh, it really highlights this as well. It, I want to really talk about this because I, I think there are some misconceptions of, oh, you have to be a certain a certain way or you have to look a certain way, you have to be a certain way to be able to advocate and to be able to do this. But with all of this now, we have to realize that there has to be some transparency in, in, in the process. So um, Sarah, I know you, you've been a big advocate for that. How do you think that DEI committees are, are, are bringing about meaningful change? And Kevin, I know you've been doing some work as well. So Sarah, can you talk about that for a second? Definitely. Um, I think that DEI committees are essential to bringing about change. I don't know that so far we've seen them be terribly effective at doing so, whether on a national level or within your own institution. Just having a DEI committee is checking one of the very first initial and low effort steps when it comes to increasing diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. So I really you know, try to caution against using just words and discussions of efforts in place of action. I don't believe that any DEI efforts, quote unquote, are worthwhile unless they actually produce results. And so facilitating actionable change is the only way to truly improve DEI in your organization, in your institution, in your residency program. Having a committee is not sufficient in and of itself. And I think that, you know, for a lot of the goals for DEI committees, they're reasonable goals. It's not that difficult to set to look at the numbers of what your representation is, of where the issues are within your own institution, and figuring out how what you can do in order to move in the correct direction, and then being transparent about that as well. Just putting on your website, oh, we have a DEI committee at our program is great, but you need to be able to say, what has your DEI committee done? And what improvements have been made within your programs and your institutions as a result of that committee? I think a lot of the work that I do when looking at how to optimize residency recruitment strategies with respect to diversity, equity, inclusion really highlights this because you know when you apply to a residency program, 
that program's using a rubric that's not vetted most of the time through HR. It's basically one or a few people's made up version of how they're scoring a professional candidate and how they will be offering a full-time employment position to somebody that's pursuing further training. And unfortunately, there's ample opportunity for bias to creep in, conscious or unconscious bias. And our residents and applicants really suffer the effects of that. The ASHP Diversity Resource Guide was recently published and showed that all minorities match at a lower rate compared to their white counterparts. And that, to me, should have been much bigger news, I think, than it really was. That's alarming, and it shouldn't be that way. And I don't know if enough questions are being asked about why is it that way and what can we do to fix it. I do have a publication coming out um, soon that I would love for everybody to, to read when it comes out about this topic in particular, and just sort of providing a framework for how to actually address this instead of just talking about addressing it. That's gonna be that's gonna be key. Kevin, what's your thoughts? I know you've been doing a ton of work as well. Yeah, I think Sarah just you know hit the nail on the head there. I think a DEI committee is one step and it's you know part of the process. Um, but look at other committees that we have, you know, thinking from an institution level, having a safety committee, you know, that committee's job is not just to say, hey, we need to be safe here are ways to be safe, you know, when they meet, they review metrics, they review objectives and initiatives and see, are we doing what we're saying we're doing or, or are we missing something? And a DEI community needs to be the same way. I think that's been my biggest ask with ACCP is, you know, we need, what, what are the metrics? What are the measures? What are the, you know, the timeline? You know, what are, you know, we need to have a goal here. We need to have clearly laid out um, transparent objectives of, what, what are we trying to achieve and when? Um, because if we keep saying, you know, oh, it'll be another year, it's another year, you know, another year down the road, that just keeps passing the buck until it gets too far down and um, you get out of control at some point, it needs to be stopped. Um, and we need to say the processes are not working. I think the other big thing with institutions is a lot of the, uh, what's the word I'm thinking for? The bureaucracy um, where, you know, there needs to be this process. So, I um, mean, you know, ACCP has had a DEI committee for, I think, two or three years now, um, and that committee each year makes recommendations to the board. Um, so that process takes about a year to formulate those recommendations and submit them to the board. Then the board has about a year to review those recommendations and decide what they want to accept or reject, which in and of itself, I think, has some issues there. Um, but then that's another year. And then the actual implementation and results from that are still more years. Um, so I think if we really want to see results from it, you know, we have to say, if we want radical results, we need radical change. And then we need to change the process and, you know, say, take that wild leap and say, you know, this is better than what we were doing. Let's try it out. Um, and if it doesn't hit, reevaluate and keep trying. Absolutely. It, so it, it seems to me that, again, I think the, 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 out, the, the backlash that how I felt it is not necessarily the things that you guys are asking. Uh, to me, from what I'm hearing is that, okay, we're doing these things. We have a committee. We have, we have these, these, these process that we're say we're doing. It appears to me that all we're asking for is what is the the outcome of those results? And some things I can think of as well is that again on a lot of residency pages they have like their residents that that are that are currently there, but they also have a, a post of like their past residents and where they're going. So you can see the process of recruiting these people, training these people, and then where they end up. And, and to me, that's what what I want to see. Okay, you have this policy is put out there, and everyone that's part of any type of leadership does strategic planning. And part of that strategic planning is going to be not only to create those ideas, to formulate them, vet them, get them put through and, and into the bylaws, but also being able to review those at, at a certain time. Uh, same thing we do for a p and committee. We we say, okay, we're going to approve this with the with the mindset that we're going to come back and look at this at, at a certain period of time. And to me, all it appears that you guys are asking and everyone's been asking for is, can we do the same process that and give the same level of effort and energy? that we do for other things in a, in a similar ballpark. Um, I remember uh, I was at a particular institution where what DEI met and we talked about uh, changing our rubrics to be able to kind of match some of the things that we've, we've been seeing out there, some published information that the University of Michigan put out there. And we make recommendations, we put it out there and then a group said, well, it's too late now, you know, we, we, we'll do it next year. 
we'll do it next year. And can we have some questions in the the interview process that allows us to to, kind of gauge some of these things to see are people good to work with? Because people, a lot of people say DEI, but it's really DEIB. And that that belonging part, I'm going to be completely honest with you. It's only a few places I ever felt like I belonged. Uh, And it's due to just the nature of how it was built. So it appears to me that we're, we're not asking for people to go and be outlandish and do all this other this crazy stuff, but just giving it the same process and give it the same, re- have it have the result and energy as it is for everything else. Am, am I, am I capturing that right guys? Absolutely. I would agree with that. So I want to transition now to the response. Cause again, when we, when we first would you plan to do this? We didn't get a response at that point, but let's transition now to the response that was happening and to give some feedback on that. So when we originally did this ACCP can promise to address these concerns in their their September issue. And they did follow up on that. And they did, again, report a lot of uh, information from the president and and going from there. And I think we've all read it. And there there, there are some thoughts when it comes to that, because that information is clearly out there. But the original the original information is not as easily accessible. Uh, Kevin, I want I want to start with you and get get your get your thoughts on that on that reply. And where should we go from here? Yeah, I think You know, I do appreciate the response. Um, I think it was thoughtful and I thought that, you know, it was appreciated that she didn't just, um, you know, say you misinterpreted my words, you know, kind of move on. Um, I stand by what I say. So I think, you know, really kind of reflecting on what was said and what, you know, the intent of the message is appreciated. And I I like highlighting a lot of the efforts that have been done and have been made. you know, again, I think it's some of that transparency that we've been asking for um, and been trying to have you know, discussions about. Um, and I do know when I, you know, I met with um, some representatives from ACCP a few weeks ago, I'm kind of in the midst of all this and you know, they took pages of notes from what we discussed and you know, I don't have all the right ideas, but I, you know, I think I had some decent ideas um, and they seem to be receptive of those. I think some of those are even enacted here as far as having that um, you know, kind of town hall venue to really have you know still maintain that open dialogue versus um the email list um i will say i personally would have appreciated to get um some kind of response from that email bucket um and yeah i don't know exactly how many emails they received i'm sure there were a lot um i think there were also probably several that um requested a response and probably kind of would have warranted that uh, more personalized response is still, you know, kind of feels a little bit generic. Um, still feels a little bit like, hey, we're doing things. Um, take a look at it. You know, kind of distracting from the issue at hand and, you know, that it, it, intention to make bold change. Mm, absolutely. Sarah, what's your thoughts? Um, so I actually interpreted it a little different um, than Kemba did. And just as a caveat, the original information is accessible on my Twitter in the form of screenshot receipts where they will live forever. Um, So if you're interested in the original messaging, you can find it there. I do applaud ACCP and Dr. Farrington for posting a response to the feedback. I think it takes a really strong leader to accept criticism and to apologize. So credit is due there. Um, However, I do feel like even in the first sentence, it reads, I sincerely apologize that the words I chose did not match the intent of my message. And this really feels like a missed opportunity to just simply apologize. But instead, it kind of feels like it puts the responsibility into the lap of the reader for misinterpreting the message instead of just apologizing um, for the message being inflammatory to begin with. Additionally, I feel it was a little misleading to include the list of committees and initiatives that ACCP is working on to address DEI. All of these initiatives were present before this letter was posted, and it's still posted. Multiple people likely signed off on that, so clearly that list of initiatives is not enough if this is the kind of stuff that's still being perpetuated within the institution. I'd like to know what they are doing now in addition to that list or how those committees and initiatives are going to specifically address this type of culture and messaging. I do um, agree with Kevin that the listening sessions in the town halls, this is an excellent way to reach members as, and I do appreciate that it's going to be a two discussion, not not just um, a didactic sort of lecture about what's being offered, but instead a live opportunity to uh, 
give feedback. And that's going to take place on Tuesday, September 26th um, for anybody interested. Perfect. Again, I think it's, it's intriguing. Again, I, I look at the whole scenario. And for me, I always like to say, I don't I don't necessarily, I, I don't have too strong of opinions because again, I feel like depending on the day and it, depending on how things are interpreted, it can go one way or the other. That's why I always get other people to, to, to let, let me hear their thoughts. But I'm, I'm intrigued by it all. Again, with, with me, again, I'll be going to ACCP. I was fortunate to uh, be, be getting recognized for some of the work I've done there. And I kind of look at all of it together and say, okay, there, there, it, it, we keep hearing it's going to take time. 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 Um, I know one year is not not necessarily <clears throat> enough all the time, but I just think it's an intriguing how a lot of this went. Mm. Yeah, I think I, I'm 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 intrigued to see what happens now and see again, like like Sarah said, what is going to happen moving forward, and I'm I'm intrigued with it with it with it all. Uh, any closing thoughts? We talked about a lot today, guys. The email, again, social media and advocacy, DEI committees and transparency, um, the response. But I just want to make sure I'm, I'm not missing the opportunity for you guys to kind of speak on different things. I, I would like for you guys to, again, highlight, again, some of that work you guys are, are, are doing. Because, again, Sarah mentioned that publication. You guys mentioned the form of wish list. So anything that can that the audience can get into now, anything that they can, they can you know, engage in and do something at their institutions. Again, this is the opportunity I, I want to give you guys to kind of speak on that. And, and, and Sarah, I'll start with you. And then Kev, we'll finish up with Kevin. I think one <laughs> message that I haven't conveyed yet is that you can be white um, and still do this work. You can be a cis heteronormative person and still do this work. In fact, it's particularly important for you to participate in this work because you are benefiting from the power dynamic and from the norm in our profession. So it can be uncomfortable if it's something that you've never done before, but please don't feel like you aren't the right demographic or the right kind of person to be doing this work because this work is for everyone be able to do. So, and there's, there's tons of resources available um, in literature and in other organizations, especially in the medical school community in ways that you can start to participate. And I also want to remind everybody how much power our voices hold. Like these organizations, their business model relies on our active participation and our money. So if it is not serving us and it is not something that we agree with, that really isn't up to them to decide. It's up to us to decide whether or not we want to continue to buy into that. And for them, and however they respond to this feedback is how we will respond with our money and our participation in the future. Thanks for that, Sarah. Kevin. Yeah, I think I just want to echo Sarah's comments there. You know, just because it might not, you might not feel like it directly affects you, um, it does, whether it's indirectly or, you know, in the future of improving our organizations, improving our profession, you know, affects everyone. Um, so, to, you know, to sit there as, you know, in my instance, a white male and say, oh, it's not my problem, I, you know, I'm not going to stay quiet on this one, you know, that's doing disjustice to our um profession or organizations, you know, our communities. Um, and so, you know, we're the ones that, you know, we do have to step up, you know, we have to fight for this, we have to speak up and, um, you know, we can't rely on minoritized communities to, you know, carry the brunt of advocating for themselves. We have to all advocate for one another and, um, you know, really come together as a community. Um, I think that's kind of my biggest thing here is um, just, you know, if you see something that doesn't feel right, speak up raise attention to it and um, advocate for change that you feel is important. Absolutely. Well, I thank you guys for, for coming on. And as, as I look at all, all this stuff and I, I tell people all the time, you know, DEI can be a personal thing. DEI, DEIB, I want to be very, you know, inclusive with that word. Uh, I say it happens at the bedside. It happens with your residents. It happens with every conversation that you have. It, you don't necessarily have to be part of a certain organization or have a certain leadership role. I think about it again, for me working at ER, most of the patients that come in who don't see a primary care provider, who don't see certain things for me, just being able to have a conversation with them, get that one blanket. Hey, are you all right? Being able to let them use the conversation, the type of language they use. I commonly walk up to my trauma patients and say, hey, bro, you good? And that's a that, that, that language to them de-arm them and say, okay, 
this was going on. And one of the stories I, I, I would tell people, I remember I had a case where I had an individual who was, again, guarding and not necessarily being uh, forthcoming because of, again, just the way he he was scared to say something. He didn't, he, he, he thought it was going to sound dumb. And I said, hey, bro, you good? Everything's okay? And he was like, nah, man, um, something hurt over here. Couldn't find out we missed the GSW to the flank on the other side because he was guarding, you know, these other things. So again, it's just certain times just communicating with someone and allowing them to communicate and not feel embarrassed or feel ashamed or feel all those things that can lead to patient outcomes. And I think of it, there's been tons of times I've probably got 50 so uh, emails and text messages from people that are residents that say like, how do I deal with being the only one? Um, how do I deal with that? And being able to have a conversation with them and just let them be themselves. You know, I, I told people at Empower last year that John Packer was my RPD again, a cis white male and he he told me one day and the reason i felt like grady was the perfect fit for me when i went there he said i just want you to be yourself i, I don't want you to agree with me and i was like what do you mean he was like i want you to, to talk how you talk i want you to do the things you want to do i want to teach you certain things but i, I don't want to teach you in a way that i feels that way i want to teach you in a way that you feel and hear the information that you think is important and that completely changed how I do everything. So if you this this podcast is because of John Packa, again, someone who just encouraged me. He said, I want you to be yourself. Don't change for anyone. Uh, don't feel ashamed by how you speak or don't feel a certain way. Again, that really changed my thought process. That's what led to Farm So Hard. That's what led to Pharmacy Pearls. That what led to the conference. And we are now in a process of making the conference so that we can, again, provide another platform for other people of diverse backgrounds. Again, because of someone who didn't fit the demographic, again, allowed me to be myself. So I, I don't think that it always have to be organizations. Again, they have their role and that job is hard. Uh, but I think everyone who's listening, DEI can be just a, a certain conversation, uh, a certain understanding and, and a certain welcoming and just true welcoming and making someone feel like they truly belong and you enjoy their diverse background. It, it can make such a huge change. So that's kind of my my thought on DEI. It can be at the bedside. It can be with your one-on-one resident. It can be with just anyone. And and it can be you creating a platform that helps other people, uh, whether it's form wet wish list, whether it's going to be literature that helps us to identify ways to make sure our processes are not, um, again, biased. All these things can, can work out. Um, and just providing people opportunities that wouldn't necessarily have been the first choice based off of certain criteria. So that's that's my that's my big thing. I'm I'm fortunate to be in a position I'm in. I'm fortunate uh to be involved in many organizations. And I know that these things will will take time. Uh but I'm hoping that we don't forget about DEI when it's not a cool thing to talk about anymore. So uh, that's all I have for today. Any other closing words guys? Thank you for allowing us to be here today and uh hope this conversation keeps on continuing. Perfect. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for all of your honesty and transparency in this discourse. Perfect, guys. Well, I won't hold you guys. You know, it's been a, a super important conversation. I hope people really could come away and take something away from, from all of this. It's just something that I think we should talk a lot more about and have more of an open dialogue. But you guys know I close it the same way every single time I close every episode, guys. You don't have to be a pharmacist. You don't have to work in an ED. But if you do, make sure you farm so hard. Closes it. Ozzy scratches his head. Whatever she's looking for, it isn't in there.